Well, I would, uh, my name is Tom Weston, and I'm uh, very pleased and grateful to the uh, uh, Uabese campus and to Professor Lee for inviting me to be here. And yesterday I certainly enjoyed the interaction with other students and faculty here, and I hope we'll have a good day today, I'm expecting that. Uh, yes, yesterday, the job we had was a little easier than today because uh, it was mainly a question of trying to explain what Marx's views are on two related things. One of them is the concept of dialectical contradiction, and the other is uh, a model of historical change called the Basin Superstructure Model. So we spent some time on that yesterday. Uh, today, we're gonna look at uh, the works of uh, Louis Althusser, we have a text that's available to you if you uh, have read it or want to read it, called Contradiction and Overdetermination. And uh, the reason it's a little more involved today is because I'm, uh, we have some arguments to follow. That is, Althusser makes some arguments that uh, some of the ways in which Marx explains historical change can't be right. Uh, and I'm going to make some arguments that some of the things Althusser says can't be right, right? So both of those things are more complicated than just explaining something, okay? So. <clears throat> oh, good, it works. <laughs> okay, so um, Louis Althusser uh, was, um, born in Algeria in 1918, and the reason you pronounce his name where you actually pronounce the R, which you wouldn't usually do in French, is because his family is from uh, the region of Alsace. Alsace is next to Germany, and they speak a little bit kind of different kind of French there. But he grew up in, in Algeria, which was a, a French colony, uh, and during the um, uh, war against the Nazis, he was captured, and he was a prisoner for a while. And after he uh, returned after the war, he uh, studied at the um, Ecole Normale Supérieure. That is uh, an elite French institution. And uh, eventually he became a professor there and spent his, uh, the rest of his active career there. Uh, he became a member of the Communist Party, oh my goodness, I spelled it wrong, Communist Party of France in 1948 which was hardly a surprise because the Communist Party in France was really the dominant intellectual force uh, for that region, right? The Communist Party had tremendous uh, prestige because of its role in, uh, in the resistance under the Nazi occupation. Uh, and that uh, any intellectual who didn't want to be connected with the Communist Party was uh, probably gonna find himself sort of out an outsider, right? Uh, Aldisser wrote about Marxism from the 40s, uh, when he was still a student, up until the 80s. Uh, and then um, eventually he wrote an uh, autobiographical memoir, which was uh, not published in his lifetime, but which is published afterwards. And um, I'll make a few comments about that memoir when we're all finished. Uh, it's important that he did not support the big student revolt that took place in France in May 1968. And I think mainly the reason for this is that the Communist Party in France did not support this revolt. This was a revolt that involved millions of students and had an alliance with workers. Of course, many other countries had big student movements in 1968. This happened in the United States and in Germany. And uh, you may know something about the Mexican, the, the, the uh, uh, student movement in 1968 in Mexico that resulted in a huge massacre in Mexico City. So uh, not supporting this movement, the Communist Party took the position that this movement is a, a bunch of crazy anarchists. And of course, actually, anarchists were prominent in the movement, not surprising. Uh, but uh, they uh, didn't support the movement. Instead, they implicitly supported the government of President de Gaulle. So Althusser went along with that, and it greatly undermined his popularity with students, who said, what use is Althusser, right? We wanted somebody 
to be a theorist of revolt or even revolution, and instead we get somebody who opposes it. So uh, he suffered his entire life from uh, bounce, bouts of mental illness. He had a depressive disease or bipolar disease. Uh, and that it made it very difficult for him to work. And one of the reasons I think that he was anxious to collaborate with students is that many of his students helped him do things that he might not have been able to do himself, right? Not that collaboration with students is not a good thing anyway, right? But uh, a number of the works that he participated in were co-written with other people. Uh, and unfortunately, in uh, about 1980, he murdered his wife. Uh, and he was uh, confined to a mental hospital. And he was found un under French law that because he was not sane at the time of the crime, uh, he could not be prosecuted. Uh, I understand French law has changed since then, partly as a result of his case. But uh, he was able to retire and to continue to write, but not to teach. Uh, and he wrote a number of things after that, including a memoir. So I think it's fair to say that in the 60s and 70s, and maybe into the 80s, Althusser was a very influential figure in, uh, in French intellectual life, right? And that, uh, that uh, even though now I think he's sort of passé, there still are people that, were his, that he influenced who have uh, continued to be important in philosophical circles. Uh, many of the postmodern figures uh, took some of their ideas from this. And uh, a very well-known philosopher who's still living in France, his name is Alain Bandieu, uh, was a student of Althusser. And uh, some people praise him as uh, the best philosopher on the earth. Not my opinion, but that shows that I think he is at least influential. <coughs> Sorry, I have to get this ready. OK. So the, the, in this work that we're reading, and uh, in many other works that came later, uh, Althusser presents himself uh, not as a, a critic of Marx, but as somebody who is uncovering the real Marx, uh, in, uh, uh, something that is difficult because he says you have to learn to read Marx in a special way. You have to learn to read Marx in a way which is called a symptomatic reading. And a symptomatic reading makes, is, it's a concept that comes from Freud. So uh, Freud will say some of the things that you do or that you fail to do are going to be symptomatic of some inner state, some unconscious state. Uh, and so that when we try to interpret people's dreams, for example, or people's mistakes, where people say something that they didn't seem to want to intend to say, so-called Freudian slip, that that's an expression of something hidden. Or uh, uh, sometimes people had, would say um, that a man who smokes a big cigar, he's treating his cigar as a symbol of his penis. But Freud says, uh, well, sometimes a good cigar is just a cigar, meaning it's not always a symptom of anything, but that sometimes it is, right? So uh, a symptomatic reading means that Althusser thought he could discover concepts, Marx's concepts in Marx's writings that Marx himself was not aware of. And so when he gives us his idea of the, the, the true Marx, it can be pretty different than what Marx actually said. Uh, okay. Let me get this straight here. So we need to talk a little bit about the historical context. Uh, in 1956, there was a big crisis in the international communist movement that had a big effect everywhere there were communist movements, and particularly in France that uh, the, after Stalin had died then a few years before, and the person who replaced him as the, pre as the preeminent leader in the Soviet Union was Nikita Khrushchev. And uh, Khrushchev, in 1956, at a party conference, uh, delivered a speech which uh, accused Stalin of being a, a kind of a monster, 
which of course it's not like no one had ever accused him of that before, but this was from inside the communist movement uh, and uh, denigrated many of the actions uh, that Stalin took. Now I think that a, an, a, an objective analysis of the speech was that most of the things in it are false. As then scholars have been over this to try to say, uh, look at the specific claims, is there any reason to believe they're true? But uh, in politics, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter whether what you say is true, it just matters that you said it, right? So <clears throat> this created a huge crisis in the communist movement, and not just the speech, but the things that were going to be introduced by Khrushchev, uh, innovations in the official philosophy of the Soviet Union, uh, in particular, getting rid of the idea uh, that uh, capitalism had to be ended by a revolution. Khrushchev said that um, capitalism could be ended and socialism brought about by a peaceful transition. Second thing that he says is that there's not an irreconcilable contradiction between uh, so the socialist societies and capitalism, particularly North American capitalism, he says they can peacefully coexist, they don't have to go to war or have one side defeat the other. So both of these things are not only innovations in Marxist thinking, but very much against the previous uh, state philosophy of the Soviet Union. Uh, in the crisis that takes place, there are a number of ideological innovations that take place, particularly in France. Uh, and one of them is a, a resurgence of a kind of humanism. Uh, that is, by humanism we mean something that says uh, something like we all have the same fundamental human nature and we can try to figure out what that human nature is. And we don't need to say that, as Marx seems to say, I believe he does have view this, that people in different classes have a different nature, right? That the social relationships determine uh, the, what is essential for being a human being in particular historical eras and particular positions in society. Uh, and, but humanism sort of ignores that point of view and says, well, we're all fundamentally the same. And uh, <clears throat> that this, one of the manifestations of this which looked a little strange is that the Communist Party did a kind of outreach to Christians, which is something they certainly hadn't done before, and it had organized dialogues between uh, Christians and, uh, uh, and uh, Communists. Now, the main guy, the, the, the French philosopher in the party was responsible for doing that, eventually dropped out <laughs> and uh, was then excoriated, but uh, certainly while he was there, they were already doing this. So, <clears throat> Uh, the, the PCF itself, the, the French Communist Party, Parti Communiste Francaise, uh, did eventually itself reject the idea that uh, capitalism should be ended with revolution and uh, for socialism. But they, uh, it took them a while to come to that conclusion. And in fact, Althusser was against the change, right? Althusser said we should still say revolution is necessary. So we need to review a little bit some ideas from yesterday about um, uh, historical materialism. We studied uh, some of the text. It's a very short, pithy text. It's a very good thing to look at again, if you want to. Uh, that uh, where Marx describes a, a framework for analyzing major historical changes. And it's a framework that decides uh, social society into uh, two pieces. One is called the base, and the base consists of the social relationships of production. So social relationships of production concern uh, who has power over production, who benefits from production, who is forced to work, who is permitted to profit. Uh, uh, under capitalism, we have a system where the you know, every, all the, everything is produced by workers, but the people who employ the workers often have not only a great power over them, but get great wealth out of their labor. So those are the social relationships here. Marx says that 
the superstructure of society, which is the state, the government, uh, and laws, but also ideas, uh, religions, philosophies, the systems of moral thought, even artistic or aesthetic points of view, these are all parts of the superstructure. And Marx's idea of, of the materialism of this view is that the, the real social relationships are the main determinant of the superstructure. The base determines the superstructure mainly. Now we talked a little last time a little bit about the idea of an organic relation, right? This is an idea from dialectics. Organically related things interact with each other, and the base and superstructure relationship is an organic relationship. So in all organic relationships, the causation always goes in both directions, but it can be much stronger in one direction than in the other. And the two things that interact with each other we're in an organic relation we'll call moments. That doesn't mean moments of time, it's a different meaning. Uh, and Marx will tell you moments always interact, but there can be a dominant moment which is, uh, has a much greater effect on the other moments than it is affected by them. So <clears throat> that uh, Marx's idea is that what brings about an era of revolution is when the relations of production conflict with the forces of production. So let's talk a little bit about what are the forces of production. So biggest force of production is the working class, right? People to do the work. Uh, but of course you can't do work in each era. There are tools and materials and uh, facilities which are necessary to do the work. And uh, those are called the means of production. So the means of production plus the workers is the forces of production. Science is also a force of production. I mean, this is a lot of strength here. So Marx says it happens from time to time that the social relationships of production come into conflict with the forces of production. And the conflict means that the social relationships of production prevent the further development of the forces of production or actually destroy forces of production. So his idea is that under capitalism, there are numerous features of the social system of capitalism which prevents the fullest development of the productive forces. Uh, one of those would be economic crises, which uh, most of us are, are old enough to remember 2008, which was a terrible worldwide crisis begun in the United States and spreading misery everywhere. Right? Uh, that economic crisis destroyed means of production and uh, also held back the further development of it. Right? The, the world economy has been rather slow in recovering from that incident. Another way in which the capitalist social relationships hold back the development of the productive forces is by causing enormous wars between imperial powers, right? It's a part of the nature of capitalist social relationships to have compete, competition between competing capitalists. Sometimes their competition is peaceful, but from time to time it breaks out into huge wars that can kill millions of people, destroy means of production, create famines, all of these things are harms or fetters or should I call it? handcuffs on the uh, on the forces of production. So that was the basic scheme that we looked at last time. Uh, I should mention to you, I, I, don't think, I don't think I have a slide, but let me mention. Yeah, I, have to make, I should put another review slide in here. So we also talked about the idea of a dialectical contradiction last time. So this is not the same as a what Marx calls a flat contradiction, like saying it's raining and it's not raining, that's a con flat contradiction. A dialectical contradiction is two things, two things which are in or an organic relationship with each other, but which oppose each other even though they depend on each other. So let me just go back to the example which we used last time. Marx will say the relationship between workers and capitalists is a dialectical contradiction. So that means there is a, a mutual dependence. Capitalists need workers 
to produce things. Workers need jobs so they can live by their wages. So in the system, both sides presuppose or depend on each other. On the other hand, they conflict with each other, right? Their conflict they, is sometimes called a struggle with each other. And you can then say that a dialectical contradiction is a unity and a struggle of opposites. Another terminology that we need to mention because it will be used by Althusser is the idea of negativity. Negativity is a, a very abstract term for describing conflict. Right? And it's part of dialectical theory to say conflict is fundamental. Conflict, negativity, is a driver of change. And this is an idea that goes very back, all the way back to Heraclitus. Heraclitus says war, or conflict, depending on your, how you jump, war is the father of everything. Which, of course, now, of course, we would perhaps say the father and mother of everything, right? So, uh, negativity, a central concept of dialectical thinking. <clears throat> so, here's what I'm calling uh, Althusser's agenda. So I should say, first of all, maybe I already said this, Althusser does represent himself as discovering the true Marx. But I think it's better to understand him as somebody who has a fundamental disagreement with Marx, which he is, he is reluctant to just say, Marx is full of shit on this, right? He's reluctant to say that, because it might mean that he's excluded from the Communist Party and considered to be a sort of an outsider of, uh, of left-wing thought in France. And things Dr. Mark Althusser said later made it clear that, that he was actually thinking that way. Right? So he says, first he says he wants to reject all dialectic ideas in Marx that are borrowed from Hegel. So uh, Marx took, said, uh, Marx has said about Hegel, he says, I am a pupil of that mighty thinker. So Hegel is a German philosopher, uh, builds a huge system, which is an idealistic system, right, that is, sees the, the, uh, the, the, the subject of history, what he calls the, the spirit, or in the form of the absolute spirit or absolute idea, somewhat different things. Uh, so, and Marx rejects Hegel's idealism, began to reject that pretty early in his study of Hegel, but he also borrowed the idea of dialectical contradiction from Hegel and many other ideas of, uh, Hege from Hegelian dialectics are borrowed from, uh, by Marx. So the Alter's agenda is trying to show that all the things that Hegel uh, that Marx borrowed from Hegel are actually wrong. And he'll claim that Marx eventually recognized that they're wrong. And after about 1845, so fairly early in his career, Marx's 1845, Marx would have been 25 years old, 25, right? Uh, <clears throat> that um, after that, he says, Marx is not a Hegelian anymore. So if you actually examine the march, this, this, the, the texts, you'll find that it is impossible to defend that idea. It's not true, right? Marx continued to use all the, all the banned concepts to use them extensively for the rest of his life, although he did change his ideas on some things. Uh, negativity is out. Also the idea of supersession so supersession means what happens when a, con a contradiction stops being a contradiction, right? So if I suppose we have a, a, a battle between two different sides in, <clears throat> am I holding this too close? Yeah. Okay. A battle between two different sides uh, in, a, in two different armies, right? That the two different armies can fight to a decision and one side will defeat the other, if not destroy the other, at least greatly weaken it and dominate it. Uh, but, and that would be called an example of supersession or resolution of a contradiction. But one of the ideas 
taken from Hegel is that whenever a contradiction is overcome or superseded, something remains of the two sides, both the side that won and the side that lost, right? So supersession has always built into it a degree of continuity, even though there is a huge change. Uh, another thing that uh, Alderser wants to get rid of is the idea of explaining things by means of saying, uh, here's a phenomenon, here's something that happens, something that's apparent, something that shows itself, and we want to explain it by finding a, 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 a purer reality, a reality behind it, called the essence of that phenomenon. And scientific work can discover the essence of a phenomenon, and then explain the occurrence of the phenomenon by means of saying, well, the essence was present and it did such and such. So Alter wants to re Alter sir wants to reject that entire kind of uh, explanation, kind of explanation Marx used all the time and and, and, and loaned up to. It. It says you know Marx says the reason science is hard is because things aren't always what they seem to be. Right, the phenomena are not always the truth. Right, it's uh, it, it's what lies behind the phenomena, the essence, which is the hard work of scientists to find that. Yes. Oh, don't go, okay, good, thanks. This is better? Okay, thanks. Uh, also, you're gonna see that Althusser rejects the basin superstructure model. Okay. That instead, the basin superstructure model, part of what it does is it says the superstructure, the ideology and the government, are a product of the social relationships. And instead, Althusser will wanna tell us the, the social, the, the superstructure itself has a kind of independent causal role which could be stronger than the role that comes from the base. So he, 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 we're gonna, he, he's gonna give us his favorite example of this and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through his example, which will be the Russian Revolution. So uh, he also wants to reject this idea that revolutions to be explained by the conflict between the forces of production and the relations of production. So I'm abbreviating that just by saying, call those the FRCs, the forces, relations, contradiction. So uh, one of the important influences on Althusser and many other thinkers of, the, of his time is structuralism. And uh, structuralism is the main advocate of it was uh, an anthropologist named uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Uh, but uh, uh, there are other people who are cited as founders of this point of view, in particular uh, an, a linguist named uh, uh, Ferdinand de Saussure. And the idea of, social, uh, of uh, constructualism is it says it sees societies, or sometimes parts of societies, like a language, as dominated by unchanging structures which may be invisible to the people that are participating in the structure. Uh, and usually the structure will be defined by a series of binary relationships, like uh, male and female, or um, a, a famous one by Levi Strauss is raw versus cooked, right? Uh, and uh, in linguistics, uh, this idea was very influential, and it had some influence on in other linguists. If you read Chomsky, you're going to see there's some influence by, on him by structuralism. Uh, <clears throat> so what, uh, one of the things that's distinctive about structuralism is that rather than having an idea like dialectics of supersession, that a contradiction leads to a, a kind of crisis in which it is resolved, and the resolution always preserves something of what is there before. The, res the resolution, the supersession, is not all is not a starting from zero. It's starting from the outcome of the previous history. But structuralism says, well, either the structures persist or they stop. They're broken. There's a rupture, and maybe a new structure takes its place. But the idea is that structures don't develop, they don't change over the course of their lifetime, 
they are what they are, and then they stop being, and that's it. So a, a third idea, I, I think I'm counting, a third idea here is that history for structuralism, history is not made by human agents. So by an agent, I mean just a doer, a person or a group of people that bring something about, right? So uh, uh, we're used to the idea that an individual person can be a doer, right? I can write a book, right? You can go to school. Uh, a group of people can be a doer, right? A, a political party or a political movement or a country or a, a social class could cooperate on some, pursue some common goal and bring it about, right? So that's agency. But structuralism wants to explain history without agency. And uh, the, the terminology for that, you call the agent a subject. So history without a subject is a slogan of structuralism. It's a slogan that Althusser accepts. So one of the things this would mean is that the traditional understanding of how a, a, a revolution to end capitalism is supposed to work, that the working class will rise up and overthrow the system, he says that's got to be the wrong explanation because then the working class would be a, a, a collective agent. Instead, structuralism will want to explain things by saying changes do happen in human history. But they are not changes that we think of as primarily being brought about by the people. It's more like things happen to people rather than that, that things are brought about by people. So, so Althusser has at least a big chunk of structuralism in his point of view. But he was very reluctant to admit this because uh, it was sort of a no-no in communist circles. And uh, eventually you'll find that the party philosophers uh, got, came around to saying, well, there's some good things in structuralism. But generally speaking, they saw this as a point of view antithetical to Marxism. So of course, it would be a good idea for structuralists, for, 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 for Althusser not to call himself a structuralist. So, uh, one of the important parts of Althusser's structuralism, however, was a thesis he had about how to interpret Marx. Now, tomorrow we're going to talk about five different ways of interpreting Marx. This is a, 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 a set of concepts developed by a Chinese philosopher, Zhang Yibing. Uh, but uh, how to interpret, in particular, what the Marx's development over his life he believed quite different things when he was, say, 20 than he did when he was 40. Uh, where, of course, this is typical of most people and almost always true of philosophers. Uh, so how do you understand the relationship between the early and the late? Uh, and Aldous's way of understanding it is a kind of structuralist way. He says there is an epistemological break, a rupture. In, it took place in 1845, he said. Up to 1845, Marx was a, a Hegelian humanist ideologist. After 1845, Marx begins to become a scientist. Right? The mature Marx uh, may not completely escape from ideology, but he's much more of a person who is creating a scientific body of thought after that point. And to do that, uh, my knowledge of certain terms, he has to get rid of the Hegelian concepts that he had, that Marx had used younger. And Alderser says he did that, but uh, as I said before, an actual careful reading of Marx's whole corpus will not give you that impression. So <clears throat> let's talk about some key concepts in Alderser. Uh, we need some of the terminology. Professor Lee also already mentioned uh, probably the most important one, which is the concept of overdetermination. Uh, but so we'll talk about this a little bit. First of all, Althusser wants to say there is no simple or primary or essential causes for events. Events are always brought about in a, in a very complex way. I mean, you can't say 
this thing, this one thing was the, was the main cause, even if some other thing needed to be there. He says, that is not true. Uh, he says, each event is the result of a unique complex of causal factors, calls this a conjuncture. Right? A conjuncture is a, com a completely unique situation that uh, is always importantly different from anything else that ever happened in the past or in the future. Right? Conjunctures are unique. Uh, and he says that the causal factors in the conjunction fuse together to produce a result. So a combination, a unique combination of circumstances produces a result. Now, I, I think you have to say something about this, which is just obviously right, right? That uh, every event is, is new in some ways, right? Even events which are very similar are going to be different in some ways, and there will always be some uniqueness. But the question is, if you emphasize the uniqueness to the point to say, well, we're not ever going to be able to have uh, the same explanation for 10 different events, then I think you have the view that Althusser has. Uh, he says, causation is overdetermined. So that means there is no main cause, that there are many influences that lead to it in combination. And sometimes Althusser would add the, another idea, which is that the things which influence, uh, the things which together produce a cause are also connected with each other, right? They're, they're not independent things. So this is an idea that is, is borrowed from Freud. And since Lacan was, excuse me, uh, Althusser was very influenced by a, a French psychoanalyst named Lacan. He probably gets it from Lacan, not directly from Freud. And Freud would say this thing about the analysis of dreams, that if you try to figure out why a, a patient dreamed a certain thing, which he can now tell his analyst, he says you're not going to find a single thing, perhaps, but you may find many different things which are somewhat connected, and the combination of them produces the dream. And it may be that the dream is, could be interpreted in the terms of any one of these several different factors, so each of which perhaps might have been independently available to produce the dream. And now I can't find that thing. So in our reading, this is the, the essay called Contradiction and, over de and Overdetermination. By, by every account, this is the uh, most important essay that he wrote. And that even though he changed his ideas sometimes, uh, somewhat later, uh, he, he never got very far, I think, from uh, this essay, right? So this is, this is vital. Uh, and he begins by attacking Hegel's dialectics as mystified. Uh, mysterious. And it's perfectly safe for him to do this because Marx said the same thing, right? That Hegel's dialectics was uh, mystical, inexplicable, had an irrational, uh, uh, even religious element in it, Marx would say. Perfectly fine to say that. Uh, uh, it's in a Marxist context, it's acceptable to say that. But yeah, I've seen over the years different ways in which people have tried to attack dialectics and argue that it's basically unsound system of, of ideas. And it's a convenient way to attack it is to start by attacking Hegel. Uh, and not then try to raise the question too much about, well, isn't some of the stuff that Hegel said not mystification or obscuritism, right? Some of it is right, we can explain it, right? So it says, Hegel is, can I say bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> Hegel is bullshit, right? But, <clears throat> uh, but then the question is, what is the relationship between Marx and Hegel? Now, Marx says, I put it a little while ago, that Hegel was a mighty thinker, and that Marx was his pupil. But he all, but Marx also disagreed very strongly with Hegel. And one of his ways of expressing that, in fact, the main way in, the, in public, was to say that, that Hegel's understanding of the world was upside down, and it needs to be inverted and put back on its feet. And 
Uh, what Marx meant by that in a general way is easy to explain, right? That is, Marx says the, 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 the real basis of, the, of reality and the change of reality is material relationships like social relationships of production and that the ideas and ideology and even governments are products of those. Uh, so the real basis of change is material. Where Hegel says the opposite, right? For him, uh, history is the, the record of a development of uh, mind or of spirit. So if you say matter is, the material is primary and spirit is a result of it, then you have a materialist view, you have a Marxist view. If you say uh, ma matter is, doesn't necessarily come into it very much, but the, the ideas or spirit are what drives history, then you have Hegel. Now, Aldisser is right to complain, however, that Marx doesn't go very much farther than this to explain what is the relationship between his dialectics and Hegel's dialectics. Marx set himself a project, he mentions this in a letter, of saying, um, <clears throat> all I need to do is uh, to sit down and write, I think he said, 20 printer sheets. Now, a printer sheet is probably three or four pages. So he was talking about 60 or 80 pages. He says, and I could explain my dialectics. But he never did that, right? And, and Althusser you know, makes a point of this, a legitimate point, right? To say, what is the specific difference between Hegelian dialectics and Marxist dialectics is really never explained. And all we have is a metaphor. And Althusser claims, well, and the metaphor is not that helpful, because really, if you invert the relationships, if you turn them upside down, you're going to change the relationships, right? You're going to change them significantly. You're going to try to transform the relationships. They have to be different. Good point. So it would have been nice <laughs> if Marx uh, had written out Hosala's dialectics. We would have, we'd appreciate that. Engels did a little more, but there's always the question of whether Engels and Marx were having, on the same page on this. Uh, what has happened really is that people who have tried to study Marx's dialectics in detail have to read his economic works and find a sentence here and a paragraph there. And I did this myself for <laughs> A, a paper that I wrote a few years ago, trying to figure out what were Marx's real views on the on the question of whether there is a nat whether there's a dialectics in nature, whether there's a natural dialectics, and I have to say it's hard work, right? So uh, you may have uh, instead of a, a on one article to read, you may have to read twenty books and take close careful notes on it. It is difficult. Okay, so. Uh, the metaphor that Marx used, the inversion metaphor, not all that helpful. So let's, uh, Althusser wanted to use the Russian Revolution of 1917, people usually call the October Revolution, although it took place in November, and uh, that uh, try to show that, the, that Marx's scheme, his base and structure model, of that revolutionary era has begun by the contradiction between the forces of production and the relations of production, that that scheme does not work for the Russian Revolution. So <clears throat> let's go through that. Okay. No, the one I'm uh, mentioning from, oh, oh, you mean the one that I wrote? It's called uh, the dialect marks on the dialectics of elliptical motion. Yeah, and uh, it's it's online for free. So okay. Uh, so uh, Althusser is mentioning what for for Lenin was almost an offhand remark. It's not something that Lenin provide, uh, provided a lot of material on. In the summer, in the late summer of 1917, Lenin had decided 
that uh, it was possible to overthrow the provisional government of Russia and that that could end the war and set up a Soviet republic, a working class or worker peasant uh, republic. And he, he wanted to make the case for that. And he said, even though Russia is the most backward and the weakest of the imperial powers that were then slogging it out in mass murder of the First World War, he says, even though Russia is the weakest link, it's still the place where revolution is really possible. Now, there were other revolutions shortly afterwards in Germany and in uh, Hungary, Austria and Hungary, and they, they were successful only very shortly. They failed, basically. Uh, so, but the one in, uh, in the, uh, Russia that became the Soviet Union did succeed. Now, uh, I, I tried to find whatever uh, Lenin had said about this, and actually, it's extremely brief. But I think what Althusser is referring to is that in the late 1920s, after Lenin had been dead for five, six years, uh, that there was a debate within the Soviet Union over what did his expression mean? What made the, uh, the, the Russians the weakest link in the imperialist chain? And there were alternative interpretations of this and a debate between basically the followers of Stalin and the followers of Bukharin about what this meant. So I think that really Althusser is working from that, right, rather than stuff from Lenin, which he doesn't quote. So you can see a quotation from uh, Lenin up there. He says, the war they're talking about is a criminal, predatory, capitalist war has brought to mankind to the brink of ruin, famine, and destruction. And let me underline famine, right, because famine is a, a failure of the means of production, right, of forces of production. So uh, Lenin used the term breakthrough. A revolutionary breakthrough is likely in Russia, more likely than elsewhere because it's backward. Uh, it had the greater hardships of the war, like famine, the rottenness of the czarist rule, and the political consciousness of the Russian workers, which he says was at a high level, partly because there had been a failed revolution 12 years before, and of course, people don't forget those things. Right? So uh, that seems to be Lenin's reasoning for saying Russia's the, least, the weakest link. So let's see if we can do the forces relations contradiction as in, uh, does that fit into Lenin's view here? Right? I, mean, I think it fits pretty well. The forces of production were held back by imperialist war and by rotten czarist rule, right? The rule of a, of a feudal monarchy, basically. Uh, and it can't meet the needs of the masses, even for food, right? So the result is famines. Uh, Lenin said only the new socialist relations of production can end war and mass misery. So there's an alternative, and it's a change in the social relations of production. Uh, it says the working class has revolutionary political consciousness and experience, and it can seize power. Uh, hence, the forces relation of contradiction was intense, and revolution is possible, right? Could lead to revolution. So uh, I think that this sort of fits into Marx's scheme here to say, well, this is the explanation, right? And I probably, I think probably that Althusser had the same idea that this is what the Marxist ex or what the what Lenin's own explanation would look like. So let's see what is his analysis of the weakest link. So he says, uh, as a result of an accumulation of specific contradictions and factors that, mu that fuse or merge together. So his point is that there isn't a single cause or a primary cause or an essential cause here. Instead, there is a complex combination of circumstances which coalesce, which they come together and they fuse and they produce the result that the revolution not only is possible, but it actually happens, right? And he says the currents and circumstances that are part of the Russian contradiction are not phenomena of the abstract contradiction. So what does that mean? It means that uh, all the particular things which were issues or contradictions or things that 
would tend to make the population want to get rid of the government. That those individual things are not the result of a single abstract contradiction like the forces versus the relations of production, right? They are individual and perhaps in some degrees independent, right? Some degree of independence. Just the overdetermined combination of factors then causes the revolution. Okay? So Altic, uh, Alters' alternate explanation is to say that uh, he doesn't say there's no forces relations of the contradiction. He just says there's no simple one. There's no main one. There's no, ascent, no, no essence here. So I think it's useful at this point to try to do a little philosophy of science. And the idea is to say, uh, how would you try to explain an, an event <coughs> or a series of events? What's, what is the kind of explanation which Althusser is rejecting? And let's try to see what that would look like. And so what I did is I picked a change of subject here. Um, whoops, we can talk about that later. I picked a change of subject here. Let's try to explain lightning strikes and see if we can explain it by overdetermination or whether that's possible or whether we can explain it by an essence and phenomena thing, right? There's something essential there and then there are the phenomena. So this is a picture of lightning strikes in a storm in uh, Romania, as it turns out. Doesn't matter though, because lightning strikes all over the world many times, and people, and the explanation has been well known. We've known this since Benjamin Franklin, right? You know, Two hundred years. Uh, first of all, lightning is a phenomenon, right? It's an appearance. It's a manifestation of something. Uh, thunder usually comes with it, so that's another phenomenon that goes along with it. Uh, lightning is the result of an electrical discharge between clouds. Or between one cloud, uh, between clouds and the ground, we know this. So I'll have a picture of it in a minute. Thunder and lightning are essentially caused by electrical discharges, but those electrical discharges only happen in certain circumstances. Sometimes you have a storm and there's no lightning, right? So the circumstances matter. That uh, the phenomenon will only be present if certain circumstances are present, even if the electrical discharge is possible at the same time. So here's a picture. Excuse me, I drew this picture, it's not great. <laughs> so you can see up in the cloud at the top, we have negative charges in the cloud. What happens in a rainstorm is that the negative charges go to the bottom of the cloud generally, and the positive charges are left over at the top. But then also, this interaction produces positively charges on the ground. And then, uh, I want to try to explain this in terms of a contradiction, a dialectical contradiction, because that would make it more similar to the, to the explanation for Russia, right? Russian Revolution. So what's the contradiction here? And you say, well, that there's a powerful attraction between electrical charges of, of, that are opposite of each other. And that powerful attraction can result in a spark. Uh, but the air in between the charges acts as an insulator. And that if the air is dry, that insulation is pretty good. Right? So if I remember from my high school physics, to make a spark one inch long, you need a difference of the two sides of 14,000 volts. But in a thunderstorm, the differences of the two sides is hundreds of thousands of volts. So you can get a very long spark that can do a lot of damage. Right? So uh, what that means is there's a conflict, a contradiction, between the charges that are attracting each other and the air which acts as an insulator. And at some point, if you're going to have a lightning strike, the insulation of the air has to be overcome. It has to break down and allow the electrical discharge to go through. Right? So the contradiction is resolved by uh, 
having the, one, the charge flow from one place to the other, so you no longer have the charge difference which produces this in the first place. Okay? I think that nothing, everything I've said here I think is completely conventional. Maybe what can be slightly different is to say, to point out there is a contradiction here that gets resolved. Okay? So, uh, I'll just look at the bottom of the slide here. It says, the essence of lightning phenomena is electrical discharge. And it's an electrical discharge which is caused by, <coughs> uh, by the breakdown of the insulation of the air. Uh, and, but it's not a fusion of a vast number of factors. I don't see the factors in a vast number. Uh, there's one primary factor. That's a huge charge difference that overcomes the insulation of the air. Okay? So, seems to me that's the right explanation, and even it's a dialectical explanation if we point out the contradiction. So, what's the difference with Althusser, though? Althusser says, well, we can't have a primary contradiction. And the idea, he says, is that each phenomenon is so unique that there can't be uh, a, a universal or common explanation for many similar phenomena uh, because they just don't have that much in common, right? They don't have common factors that could be the primary factor in each of many different lightning strikes or each of many different re re uh, revolutions. And we have a name for that in philosophy, the idea that every case is unique, special. Uh, it's called nominalism. Right? Nominalism means that uh, there are no real properties or universals that different things have in common, or at least there aren't enough properties they have in common that could explain how they behave. Right? So, but we have back into ancient philosophy and Plato and Aristotle are already telling you the explanation uh, for many phenomena is that they express some universal, some something essential. Uh, but Althusser is denying that. And Althusser understands himself that his view is nominalist. He doesn't say it in this article, but he does understand it. Right? Because he, he says that uh, uh, nominalism is the, I think he uses the term, anti-room of materialism. Ante room means the little chamber outside the royal chamber, right? Uh, so Marx himself said that the earliest forms of materialism were nominalistic. And he, I think Marx has in mind things in the Middle Ages, people like um, William of Ockham, right? Who was a, Ockham is supposed to be one of the first nominalists. And within that context of Catholic, Catholic theology, as close as you could get to nominalism. Right? So uh, Alter uh, 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 discusses his own nominalism in a way in which it makes it seem like that it's not a past and primitive kind of materialism, but sort of an entry rate of materialism. Okay. So let's talk about the second Russian example. So this is the place where Alter is using this example really to make his case for that overdetermination is the best answer or the only answer. Okay? So we need to start with some historical context. So that in the USSR in the late 30s, and especially in a year and a half period from 1937 uh, in the middle to 1938, uh, there was a wave of repression that took place in the Soviet Union. And it cost uh, a little bit under 700,000 lives of people who were executed for political crimes. So this is a horrifying number, even though the numbers that often you hear in the press are 10 or 15 times that much. The, the archives, the Soviet archives are open and we know what the facts are now, right? And uh, that this is pretty horrifying and it was known enough about uh, in this in France that many people were horrified about it. Uh, and that Khrushchev in the 50s, 
made a big issue of this in his secret speech of 1956 because he's saying, well, what you've heard about is true, or at least some of it's true, right? It's an endorsement from inside the Soviet Union of the claim that the Soviet government had committed large-scale political crimes, right? So uh, Khrushchev used this fact of repression to discredit earlier policies. So Aldous says, well, what is the explanation that we have for the existence of this, not only a repressive government, but actual repression, right, that costs hundreds of thousands of lives from people who are, I should say, I think it's pretty clear in retrospect, most of them not guilty of any crimes. Doesn't mean there was nobody guilty of, say, rebellion or crime, but the majority probably were not involved, that seems likely. So, uh, he says, this repression cannot be explained by the basin superstructure model, but only by overdetermination. So let's <clears throat> see how that works. He says, suppose, as the basin superstructure model says, that if there's a new set of social relationships then that should generate a new uh, set, uh, a new set of ideas and a new set of governments and practices, right? So the superstructure should change so that it massive, mash, matches the new social relationships. And these would be the social relationships of socialism, uh, which was uh, by the late 1930s, the, the official view that the Soviet government had of itself, that it's socialist. Uh, he says, we can think of the repressions of the 30s as survivals or reactivations of politics from Tsarist times, of the old superstructure. And Marx did talk about this in other cases, Mark, that, that some of the times the, the old ideas hang around for a long time and that uh, they can be, do a lot of harm, but they are, they're still around. Marx uses that example in his book, uh, The 18th Brumaire. So he says, hence the superstructure could not be the result of the base because uh, the, the base should have produced a superstructure which is not capable of massive repression. So it must be overdetermination which gives the superstructure a powerful role uh, must be right. Right? That is the idea of overdetermination, and Malthusar makes this clear. The main advantage that, all, that overdetermination is supposed to have over the base and superstructure model is that overdetermination allows you to give great causal effectiveness, causal power to the superstructure and to ideology in particular. Whereas the base and superstructure says the base is the main cause and the superstructure is, the, is mainly a result. Right? So, uh, superstructure could uh, not be the re result of the base because the base would have created new governmental relations and new ideas and laws and such which would not allow this to happen. So, let's uh, make some responses to this argument. So, for one thing, supersession always retains something from each side of resolved contradiction. Right? That's a general idea of dialectical thinking. So that there should be something left over from the previous days afterwards wouldn't be at all surprising if you're a dialectical thinker. But, but I don't think that's the main response. I mean, it's the response ultras uh, should have considered, right? It's the, it's the obvious one. Uh, but uh, I would say, how complete was the change in the base? As, uh, unlike communism, Socialism has much in common with capitalism. Socialism has a wage system. It has a significant inequality among workers. And generally speaking, the people in the government or people who are party leaders are much better off than other people. Uh, and they have uh, a privilege for leaders. They're not just servants of the people. They are richly rewarded. Generally, that was true in the Soviet Union at, at the time of this repression. Uh, and uh, he says, uh, socialism also has a repressive state. That, that's a fact, right? So 
you, it seems to me you could respond by saying uh, the, the social relationships were different, but they were not very different, right? That is, socialism is so capitalist-like that you shouldn't expect uh, a government to behave in a way that's utterly different from a capitalist government. So uh, Althusser could have considered that, but he doesn't seem to have. So let's switch the subject a little bit and talk about uh, his ideas about agency. I already mentioned some of these things. Uh, Marx said that people make their own history, but not in circumstances they choose. Right, so you people can plan and unite and try to carry out their, try to achieve goals, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Uh, but they do so in circumstances that they didn't choose, right? So some things are a given, and some things are available for change, and when they are available, sometimes people change them, right? So that's his idea. Uh, another way of putting this is to see what the Communist Manifesto says that history is mainly the record of class struggle. So class struggle is what drives history. That's a kind of conflict between classes. And Marx and Engels, who also wrote that thing, thought this was true not just of capitalism, but of previous societies. And Engels had a little footnote on that statement in the later editions of, he says, when Marx and I wrote this, we didn't know that there had once existed in human prehistory classless societies. So you would have to say uh, something like, when classes exist, <laughs> they are the motives of history, right? So uh, at any rate, I think Marxism is committed to the idea of collective agency of classes, not just the working classes, but other classes can act together and they can do things to try to meet their goals. Althusser claimed that history can't be explained as the actions of subjects. Now, partly he does this by just adopting a structuralist point of view, a common view that his readers would be familiar with. But, but he has a second way of doing that, which is a late, his later theory of uh, what he calls a theory of ideology. He develops a theory in about 1970, I think this happens, where he says that <clears throat> uh, ideology isn't just about ideas. In fact, it's not mainly about ideas. It's about practices. It's about activities. And that what ideology does is it tries to, mo at least the ideology that's generated by the ruling class, is it tries to mold people into subjects, but subjects that are only capable of behaving in a way that the ruling class wants it to. So uh, his example would be, for example, suppose that I'm uh, walking down the street and I can see a cop who raises his hand and says, hey, you, come over here. Uh, am I going to come over? <laughs> Most people would, right? Or at least they'd at least look around and see uh, what's going on here. I mean, I have to come over there, right? Alder says that the habit that you're going to think you have to respond to what the policeman said to you is a result of a kind of ideology. That is, that the the your the the institutions of society uh, have made you into the kind of person that has to respond to the police. Maybe you don't have to say yes, officer, right? But you have to pay attention to them anyway, right? So he says that's uh, an ideological molding of people into a different kind of subject. You see some of this in other thinkers. You're going to this should sound familiar if you if you've studied Foucault, right? The ways in which uh, that uh, uh, the, the the dominant powers of society make the the rest of us into a certain kind of subject. Uh, and so what this means is not that we're not subject at all according to Althusser, but we're not very capable subjects, which is pretty different from Marx. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx says that the, the working class is the grave diggers of capitalism. And he says that's the, 
That's the, the way in which capitalism limits itself. This is a kind of dialectical idea, that capitalism sort of produces its own enemy. And that enemy, Marx says, will eventually defeat it, right? The workers will eventually run the world. Uh, because they, capitalism has created people who are capable of being grave diggers. People who are pretty miserable, who understand that better lives are possible, but only if they unite and do something to change the system. Right? So Marx is doubling down even on, um, on uh, agency, what Althusser will call subjects, subjects capable of making real difference. Althusser very much plays this idea down. Uh, he's clear in later works that the working class cannot make a revolution. That doesn't mean that socialism or communism could never happen, but it wouldn't be made. It would be more like something that just happens. If you read uh, Badil, you see this thing, it's, it's the same thing is there, right? Badir says, we, we can't create a new future. We can only look into the void, right? And the void is the, it's the possibilities, right? The stuff which is not yet. We can look into the void. So Althusser's later views, uh, I mentioned the, the uh, memoir that he wrote. And uh, he says in the, in the memoir that his concentration on some of the texts that he talked about in Marx, Capital, and uh, Communist Manifesto, and other things, he said, calls them sacred texts. And his idea is, well, I wasn't actually so interested in these things, but if I wanted to make an intervention in French politics and party life, I, I had to talk about them, right? So uh, he says he had to use Marx's sacred texts. But himself, he went on to talk about, to study other philosophers who he thought were more important. Uh, number one probably would be Machiavelli, and next would be Spinoza. Uh, and uh, his, uh, he says that Marx was not much of a philosopher, as a matter of fact. Right? So uh, he also advocated, this is beginning about 1978, a, a, different, a different version of um, materialism. It may actually not be that different from Epicurus, but uh, who he cites. But he calls this... Um, aleatory materialism, or the materialism of the encounter. And the way people have understood this, and it's not so clear exactly how you understand it, is um, that it means that history is sort of random, right? Stuff happens mostly by accident. Everything is contingent. There are no historic laws of historical development, not only not the ones that Marx proposed, but not any others anyway, right? History is completely contingent. So this has been a popular idea. Um, when people who are not interested in Marx sometimes say this. I have a colleague in my department whose point of view is this. He's a Levinas follower. I don't know if that uh, has anything to do. But let me, let me give you an example. That, uh, am I running over? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. OK. I won't give you the example. Uh, I just wind up by saying, let, let, me, let me ask this. Um, <clears throat> Althusser does, there's a really big break, a big difference between the younger Althusser that we read and the older one who writes the memoirs. So what is the relationship between the two? Just the same question he asked about Marx. Is there a, an abrupt structural break at some point? Or is his later view a dialectical development of the earlier view? And since I've already talked, gee whiz, I'm sorry. <laughs> Next time, hit me over the head. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but this should leave us, I don't know, 40 minutes anyway for, to talk. So thank you very much. And uh, questions and comments are in order. <laughs>